Hello, James. Hi there. So we will talk about how our per perception of intelligence shapes our relationship with the, with the world around us and about other forms of intelligence on Earth and about new sorts of intelligence that we have been busy creating for decades now, like artificial intelligence that we call artificial. So it's a broad and fascinating topic, and you've dedicated a book to it titled Ways of Being, Animals, Plants, Machines, and the Search for Planetary Intelligence. And now it's available in, in French for those of the French speakers listening. And it's called Toutes les Intelligences du Monde. To start with, can you introduce yourself and tell me about your background and what, how would you describe the, the lenses that you're using when you look at the world and at our times? Yeah, so I'm, I have sort of a number of backgrounds. I have a background academically a long time ago as a computer scientist, but also like specializing in artificial intelligence in the kind of last wave of AI. So before the current big hype, the last time it got slightly hyped and then disappeared again, that was when I was sort of working more in it, studying it. And then I've worked in publishing and I've worked in the web and various other places. And, and for the last decade or more, I've mostly practiced as a, a writer and as an artist, looking at how broadly the ways in which we understand the things around us shape our lives. And for a long time, that was mostly concerned with technology, particularly the internet, and the way in which not just how new technologies, network technologies shape our lives, but how our understanding of those things shape our lives. So the extent to which we actually understand how the things around us work really matters to how they actually affect us. And I've written and made quite a lot of work about the internet and, and, and other kind of contemporary technologies in various ways. And in the last few years, in response to fairly obviously the situation we find ourselves at present ecologically, I've kind of been shifting my practice towards an ecological framework, but also trying to work out like what can I bring from my thinking about, about technology and how I've kind of understood the relationship between technology, politics, society to bear on ecological questions. And the result of that is, is this new book, Toutes les Intelligences du Monde, where I really try and expand some of these ideas from being quite narrow technological ideas, ones that are often really just framed by the people in power or the people who work in tech companies and so on and so forth, and try and put them into a bit more context and try and bring them into dialogue with other ideas. Yeah, so we, I think we can have a second interview related to your previous work on the internet because it's also a fascinating topic, but... Yeah, today I want to focus on, on that latest book. So, and this is something I heard you mentioning, and we can go back to this later, but I have the feeling that we are at a very special point in history, and it's very strange because we are starting to see emerge a new form of what we call intelligence that we call AI, and that keeps surprising us. And at the same time, we start to realize that there are plenty of forms of intelligence in nature that we can observe and that we don't really understand. Is it one of the reasons why you wrote this book? And I would like to understand better why the matter of intelligence matters so much n now, you know, according to you. Why is it such a, an important topic? I mean, that's kind of why I wrote this or got interested in it, because I found it so extraordinarily fascinating that we seem so obsessed with this idea. Because it's really like one of the kind of central questions, I think, of our time. And I really, I, it just became very evident to me that there was this sort of strange coming together, as you say, of these two kind of areas of interest that weren't being well connected, but seemed to be very present, which was on the one hand, we're starting to see very powerful computer systems. And we could have a discussion about what we actually mean when we say AI, but let's, I, let's just say very powerful computer systems that do very clever things in, on the one side that gets this label AI that gets us very excited. And on the other hand, there's, there's a growing pressure from various directions, both from scientific research into kind of animal behaviorism, from, from ecological relationships, but also from non-Western systems of knowledge, from indigenous knowledge systems that have always recognized the intelligence of other beings to reorient our relationship towards other species at a time of planetary crisis, when obviously, or oh, it seems to me that so much of our current, so many of our current problems, so much of the, the pressure pushing us towards quite bad planetary outcomes comes about of, of our bad relationships with other species. And so the fact that we can sort of manage to hold these two things at once is really interesting to me. That this kind mm -hmm. of, on the one hand, this, this intelligence possibly emerging uh, or forever present, but starting to be recognized in, in the, in 
in, on the, in the rest of the planet. And on the other hand, this kind of weird toy intelligence that we're building ourselves that comes with all of this mythological weight, all of this kind of weight of science fiction films, all of this priming for what we might expect, and that strikes at something so mm -hmm. fundamental to being human, which is this, you know, this real idea that like AI, whatever it is, is somehow some sort of competition to us or some kind of threat to us. It triggers us in all these kind of ways because our mm -hmm. intelligence is one of the things that makes us think we're special. That makes us think we're, we're, we're this kind of unique species. And, and so suddenly the, you know, having spent centuries and in differing cultures separating ourselves from other forms of intelligence in order to convince ourselves that we're better and, you know, we, that we can take advantage of other species. Yeah. Suddenly the call is coming from inside the house and we've made these little boxes that also have this kind of weird way of speaking to us. And it produces a whole bunch of very strange psychological effects. And it's absolutely fascinating to look at. Yes. And actually, I want to kind of divide the conversation in two. First, talk about intelligence and what what is related to intelligence in nature in your book that we don't understand. And then we can talk about AI and, and try to regroup everything uh, as a whole. Because this is what I do broadly. Usually, I try to define the terms of the conversation. And here, we have a very interesting term to define, which is intelligence. What is it? And what would you say is our common understanding, our common definition of intelligence? And is it a good one? So I'll, I'll start by saying that I don't tend to try and defy terms. In fact, I think that's quite often part of the problem. And that historically part of the problem has been that we've tried to find these really fixed definitions for things. And then we've stuck to them, despite, you know, all of the stuff that gets excluded or, or, or left out, um, or kind of actively erased by that process of kind of definition making. Um, and you can see it very clearly in, in the history of like our ideas about what constitutes intelligence. You know, when I set out to write this book, I assumed that somewhere I would find like the real definition of intelligence that people used, even just in an academic context or whatever it is, but that somewhere there would be like, okay, this is what we say intelligence is. And here we go. That doesn't really exist. Intelligence is not a concept that is that rigorously defined or it very rigorously defined within very narrow boundaries in certain disciplines but really what we mean when we say when you hear people talk about intelligence in general whether it's people talk about artificial intelligence whether it's talking about smart people whatever it is what they mean is what humans do right like there's a whole grab bag of different things planning memory thinking ahead face recognition any of these kind of qualities that involve some kind of mental processing and interacting with the world. But as soon as you bring in that term intelligence, it comes with a whole bunch of assumptions about who's doing that thinking and how they're doing that thinking. And so wh when the term gets narrowed down, it's mostly in this kind of exclusionary way, right? Um, that we, can we say something mm -hmm. is intelligent? And we've been doing this to AI and to non-humans for a very long time, drawing these kind of totally arbitrary lines between the kinds of thinking that we accept as being intelligent, as though it's some kind of weird and exclusive club. And what I'm mostly interested in doing is kind of actually expanding that definition to see what we can include within it in, in, you know, in, a, in a much broader array, and then seeing what happens when you do that. How do you respond? How do you have different kinds of relationships when you start to accept or see things as being intelligent rather than trying to, trying to kind of gatekeep that definition? And did you find that how we define intelligence through time has evolved and has it shaped our relationship with the world around us and the living world around us? Would you say that the way we approach or the way we define intelligence in a specific culture has a role in how it's shaping our relationship with the living world around us? Uh, some say that, for example, the fact that we start to consider human being different from the other species, species has a huge influence about on civil, how the shape of civilization. And how would you describe that relationship and its evolution through time and through different cultures? Well, I mean, I'm not a specific historian in this, but it's fairly clear that there are differences within different cultures to the degree to which we acknowledge not just the intelligence, but the kind of agency, consciousness, beinghood of other species. And in Western culture, that has a long a very long cultural history, and it goes back to kind of monotheistic religions. You know, in the Bible, it's written that, that God gives all the plants and the animals to man for his use. 
right? And that's been used for millennia to justify human exploitation of other species. Uh, more recently, this kind of scientific enlightenment in, in Europe uh, really reduced beasts to the, the status of machines. Uh, the Descartian idea of consciousness completely excluded uh, non-humans. Descartes performed horrific experiments on animals because he didn't believe they had mm -hmm. souls or consciousness or any kind of awareness. And that, that belief has created not just the, a system of human exceptionalism, a, a vastly abusive regime of kind of mass agriculture that we have in the present moment, the slaughter of you know, millions of animals every day under horrifying conditions, and the kind of ecological damage from that as well. But kind of a further ecological damage where we see the whole world as a kind of resource for extraction. And it even has a relationship to our relationship to, to other human beings. Historians have shown the ways in which cultures which exploited animals that developed agriculture along certain lines also went on to exploit other human beings. There's a relationship to the abuse of animals, to, to slave keeping, to uh, gender inequality, to these kind of things. So really our relationship with other species is part of a, a continuum with a whole bunch of other kind of issues that we have relating to one another, to creatures and, and to the planet. But it is also one that's, as you say, is, is really highly variable. And, and as in most things, it's been taken to its kind of most extreme in the West under the kind of dominant science. But many, many cultures have preserved a relationship that doesn't, isn't just in better harmony with this kind of ecological relations, but actually views them as having their own agency and beinghood. So much of what I write in the book about this supposedly wondrous discovery of intelligence amongst animals is like completely obvious to very large numbers of people mm -hmm. who've always blown up, grown up knowing that, that, that other creatures are intelligence and as a result have very different societal and ecological relations. What's also very interesting here is that you can, even if you say we don't have a precise definition of intelligence, it seems that every culture has its kind of own way of looking at it and also influences how they will treat other people, other cultures, other animals. And you can see this through history, trying to rank cultures and trying to rank groups of people by looking down on them because they say, you know, they are dumb or they are dumber than us, or we are more intelligent as people. And therefore we can, yeah, we can treat them badly. We can also look down on our ancestors, thinking that prehistoric humans were dumb. And we have actually new discoveries on that challenge, that view that we're actually smarter than the people before us. Can you tell if, a few words about that, I, about this? I don't know exactly which discovery you're referring to, but I mean, there's certainly... A... I mean, in your book, you mentioned the fact that we are we're discovering that actually pre before the civilization existed, humans were already very, very intelligent and they had just a different way of being intelligent. Right. So, so I mean, this term civilization starts to become a very questionable one, I think, at that moment. And I mean, perhaps you're referring to a couple of things I write in the book, yep. like the discovery of Gobekli Tepe, which is an extraordinary archaeological site and once a great mm -hmm. temple in southern Anatolia in, in what's now Turkey. And this is a site that's tens of thousands of years old. And basically when it was discovered, it kind of upends our understanding of how what we call civilization developed, because the prevailing theory had always been that humans only became capable of kind of works of art, of architecture, of a kind of nuanced, complex culture once we settled down and became farmers. And that turns out to be not true because this vast temple complex predates agriculture and was clearly a place at which people who we considered to be hunter-gatherers, which is again also a contested term these days, would gather for kind of seasonal festivities. They quite clearly had really huge parties there. And that they had a complex social life, a religious orientation, all of these kind of things on completely different lines. And, you know, it's not just our ancestors either. You know, Neanderthal peoples who are a separate branch of the kind of evolutionary tree, although we are related to them and there was mm -hmm. uh, crossbreeding in various ways, they had their own culture that they evolved separately. Like other human cultures have existed on the planet like at different times, long, long before, in fact, Homo sapiens even kind of appeared on the scene. And culture mm -hmm. is also critically not exclusive to human beings. Non-humans have culture as well. Even if we don't necessarily recognize it as civilization, we recognize their ability to tell stories, to mourn, to make artifacts, to do these kind of things uh, that we recognize as cultural within humans. So that, that very narrow kind of timeline of civilization that we've been taught for so long in the West really is kind of fraying and coming apart with a lot of these realizations. And 
I want to talk about other the animals and the intelligence that we can find in nature because your book is full of it. But to start with, what is the problem with our approach to understanding other living beings? Is it because of the tests and, meso- and methods that are wrong and we fail to see intelligence in them? Or is it because we tend to divide things into parts and classify into categories? You mentioned the fact that we want to define everything. Or is it because we are simply limited and there are some things that, that we don't understand? Yeah, I mean, those are, those are all good reasons. To say. I mean, I, th- I think again, we should be careful with the, which we we are talking about here because even within sort of Western yeah. dominant science culture, that historically, I think, was a problem within scientific research, as within all areas of historical research, of the kind of ways in which experiments were designed. I think there's a lot of researchers out there who are much smarter than that and doing incredibly interesting, more complex things than perhaps a couple of the examples that I'll give in a moment. But it's, it's just always worth remembering that like popular culture lags a long way behind kind of scientific research uh, most of the time for a whole bunch of other reasons we probably don't need to go into. You know, I, I think a lot about the fact that the discovery of relativity is now over like a hundred years ago, right? But has barely entered culture. Like we still live with an entirely Newtonian culture, yeah. even though the science is just in a totally different place that has r- quite radical implications for how we should understand the world. And so a, a lot of our relationships with more than humans and, and our understanding of things like species, which turns out to be very problematic, you know, are, are really in a very different place in a lot of research than it is kind of in common understanding, which is really great for us to kind of talk about and disseminate. So you know, maybe it's okay. Um, but with regard to these, these questions of, you know, why, why we, we've kind of struggled to recognize in other species. I think you're right in that historically, we, because we've centered human intelligence, all of our tests, essentially, these kind of experiments we've done on other beings have been about whether they meet some of these kind of arbitrary criteria. And that leads to all kinds of kind of particular problems with that our ability to see their intelligence, first of all, because first of all, there can only be intelligence in that model in particular ways that we recognize as being intelligent. So we set them all these weird mm-hmm. tests, like looking at themselves in the mirror and seeing if they recognize each other or you know, using kind of various tools, solving problems that are essentially problems for humans <laughs> that aren't necessarily issues in their world. The mirror test is a classic example <laughs> because a bunch of different animals behave very, very differently when shown the mirror. Some primates like us react much like us. If they haven't seen a mirror before, they might be a bit kind of freaked out at first, but after a bit of getting used to it, they will kind of look at themselves. They'll touch marks on their faces if something's been kind of painted on their face or something, or their pool faces or whatever they'll do, they'll interact in this way. And they seem to recognize themselves. Except not always the same mm-hmm. way. That gorillas, weirdly, seem to be incredibly shy in front of mirrors. They don't like being seen. Uh, it might have something to do with the role of uh, eye contact in their culture. Macaque monkeys and, and rhesus monkeys, other small, smaller primates, they tend to look at their genitals mostly rather than their faces. And that's what they do out in the wild. Again, th- there's issues around eye contact, dominance, sexual display. Mm-hmm. So they, don't, they simply don't behave in front of a mirror in the same way. When they first tried to do the mirror test on dolphins, the dolphins yeah. immediately just had a lot of sex in front of the mirrors. That's what they seem to be interested in doing. And so you just do something as simple as the lens of this, this mirror test, which is endlessly fascinating, but I think scientifically really quite rocky. You start to see these kind of different ways in which intelligence manifests. There's something going on here that you really have to be quite, um, you know, hardline to not recognize as an intelligent response, but it's a response that's radically different to our own. I, I should also mention actually that the, the mirror test varies across cultures and that white Europeans and, and, and people from other cultures don't necessarily pass or address this test in the same way. So there's variants across human species, let, let, across humans, not just across other mm-hmm. species. But like one of the real findings of this kind of stuff is that you start to understand that, yeah, there are different ways of doing intelligence. The intelligence is something that is not like a singular fixed quality inside the mind, but is something that is actually done as a result of kind of relationships and encounters. And that's one of the reasons also why it's sometimes hard to recognize, as you said, because while it's possible for us to imagine perhaps a little bit about what it's like to be you know, a monkey or an ape 
perhaps a little bit, a tiny bit, because at least we share like four limbs mm -hmm. and like a head on top of our bodies and like we walk around, you know. Uh, it's kind of impossible to imagine what it's like to be a jellyfish, yeah. right? Or, or, you know, almost anything that lives in the sea or, or a bird or, you know, the, the, even though they may display these intelligent behaviors, the, the, their minds and, and the environments in which they live and their experiences are so radically different from ours that this idea that we could construct their world in such a way that we could understand it is, you know, starts to lose sense. Yeah, th this is what you say. Intelligence is embodied. It really depends off the senses that we, that we have and our own perception as human beings is, is clearly not the same as other animals. And therefore, and the environment in which we live, you mentioned the sea, and therefore we cannot you cannot fathom, we cannot imagine what it is to be an octopus, for example. And yet, and this is one of the examples you have in your in your book, because octopuses are amazing animals. On the contrary to apes, here is a species that have very few things in common with us. Maybe some ancestor, you talk about a little bit warm, but it's really, really not the same type of heritage. And yet, they show evidence signs of intelligence and even the intelligence the kind of intelligence that we define as being like close to to humans like they can escape traps they can understand really really, really sophisticated things what are the learnings when it comes to an animal like a, like an octopus displaying signs of intelligence that we can understand actually in some ways i mean i guess the way you're putting it there and you, you've told some of the good stories about them already it's a bit it's a bit like gobekli tepe right it's a bit like that turkish like temple we discovered under a, under a vast hill that that it completely blows the the timeline away the way in which we've constructed so much of our ideas because the 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 you know the the image that we've been taught given handed down in the west for, for centuries is is of this kind of slowly rising arc uh, of of many things of progress but also of, of evolutionary development of intelligence and it's always this arc you know, or stairway or tower with humans at the top, right? That says that, you know, we are, we are unique. Mm -hmm. We are uniquely special. We are like the most evolved thing of all. We sit at the peak of that. When in fact, you know, when you meet something like the octopus, it challenges our understanding of, of what it means to be at the top of, of some kind of statue like that because of its extraordinary capabilities, right? Like in addition to ones you mentioned, like one of my favorite examples is that octopuses are capable of recognizing individual humans. They, they, they have very good facial recognition. Like they've, they've tested this even by having, you know, two quite similar looking people who live, who work in a kind of research laboratory, wear the same clothing every day, but then treat the octopuses slightly differently. Like one of them would give it food and the other one would basically poke it with a stick. And after like a week, the octopus would greet one and squirt water at the other one consistently. Right. I mean, it's pretty easy to establish. Now, humans can't tell individual octopuses apart. <laughs> like, I mean, maybe if you spent a lot of time like in the same place, whatever, but like we don't have facial recognition for octopuses, but octopuses are clearly capable of recognizing us. So like already you have one quality that they seem to be like more advanced in, in a kind of thinking than us. And, and, and yet like this really confounding stuff about that, because they live inside this radically different medium. They, they spend most of their time underwater and yet they're capable of, of, of doing this work also up and out of the water. You know, they, when they escape from their tanks and they run around or they just skitter across the rocks, right? They can exist in a different medium, again, in ways that we can't do. And yet also they only live for about two years, most of them. And this, this is a totally unsolved question is that we don't really understand where octopus culture comes from because there are, there's some evidence of octopus culture in kind of architecture building, structure building, this kind of stuff and some kind of communities that have been found, but there's no way in which those get passed on generationally. So it's a huge mystery. It's not a, it's a kind of intelligence that we don't, we really, as well as it being just so bizarre in so many ways, we also don't really know, uh, understand how it comes about or how it's passed down in, in the way that we think, uh, you know, is that relationship that the culture is kind of encoded intelligence that can be passed down generationally. So there's all this mystery there, but mostly it just tells us that like, whatever this thing is, we call intelligence, you know, and again, I want to keep that term really kind of as blurry as possible to keep it as interesting as possible. Whatever we think that is, it, it, it's not something that's part of a hierarchical, upward trending lineage. It's something that's kind of exploding out like a firework with all these different variants of it happening kind of all over the place, evolving in all these kind of different ways. You know, and I, I, I sort of the, 
when I said earlier that like there's this illusion that humans are kind of the most evolved things on the planet. I always come back to the, the words of the evolutionary biologist Lynn Margulis, an extraordinary scholar, you know, and her phrase that everything is equally evolved. Like everything on this planet, including us and the, the jellyfish and the octopus and the giraffe and the frog and the toad and the whatever, we've all been evolving for the same length of time, right? Since the very dawn of life on this planet. Nothing is more evolved yeah. than anything else, and it each has found its own kind of expression in the world as a result. Well, I find these quotes really amazing because it's so insightful. It's it actually strikes me because it's it's something that we never think of because we, we indeed tend to see ourselves as superior, as as very different from any other species, and indeed we are very different. But but as you say, when you realize that. You can define intelligence as being able, adapted to your environment, and then you see all the spaces you know are very well adapted to their environment. When you realize that, yeah, evolution has been the same for every living being on Earth. Like uh, every species has ancestors and millions of years of evolutions and interaction with those species. It's. Uh, can you elaborate on what it means and what are the insights related to we are equally evolved? Because I, I find it very powerful. I mean, for me, the, the the main kind of understanding of that is is that you just have to be kind of humble towards this idea of human uniqueness. Humans are one particular expression of evolution, an endlessly fascinating one. Uh, and each individual, really, you know, in any species, has its own unique experience of the world and its own ex unique expression of that. But we're not unique in terms of our like experience of the world. We all share and experience this world in all of these different ways, you know, and what I'm always fascinated by and therefore looking for and trying to find all these times are these little moments when you can imagine what that slightly larger shared world actually looks and feels like. So with, with other humans, we, we broadly understand what we share. We don't even think about it, but you know, we, we share like the frequencies of light, right? And then the audible range. And the, the tactility, the, the feeling of the world yep. around us and the architectures we build out of that and so on and so forth. That is our shared world, right? What is the world we share with plants, for example? You know? Well, we share the sun. We share the feel of sunlight on the skin. We, we, we share the, we, we, to some extent, the, the kind of chemistry of the earth, right? Which, whether it's, whether we're rooted in it or whether we drink the water that comes out of it or mine it or whatever, that's part of our kind of shared experience of the earth. We discover more when we start looking. We now understand that plants here, right? Uh, these extraordinary experiments that were done in Britain, I think the University of Bristol a few years ago, where they, they took the cabbage white cat, uh, caterpillars and they put them on the plant and they saw that when the caterpillars started eating, munching on the plant leaves, they, the, the plant immediately responded by putting these chemicals into the plant leaves. And then they took the caterpillars away, and sometime later, they just played the, sa the plant, the sound of the caterpillars chewing on leaves. And immediately, the plant responded in the same way with these chemicals. So plants can hear, right? <laughs> Which is, what, do we, what are we even supposed to do with that yeah. information, right? To, to understand that the vegetation <laughs> that surrounds us is also participating in the oral world in some way, right? And further experiments have shown that plants... Yeah, some people will say, yeah, of course, you know, I'm talking to my plants every day and they, and they react. And, you know, you're telling me that I was crazy talking to my plants. Actually, they can hear, you know, it's a... Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, what, what? they can hear and they can communicate and they can remember Absolutely. things. And they, there's further experiments, as you say, have shown that plants have, have forms of memory, that they can uh, adapt to things that have happened to them in the past. They can recall that experience, change their behavior. Um, they communicate, they share resources, um, they, they do so many of the things it's starting to turn out that, that, that we do. Uh, and when we do them, we call them intelligent. And so this, this kind of, you know, world of awareness opens up. It's not the only way of finding that kind mm. of shared space. There are other ways of having that awareness, that consciousness, even that communication with plants. But it's amazing to see the, the science expand and the kind of awareness expand that allows us to access that, you know, very specifically. Can, can we dwell a little bit on this? Because it's, again, it's very interesting to realize that science is telling us, is discovering so many things, for example, related to trees and, and how they communicate. And more and more, actually, we can even see a forest as one kind of living being because it's such a complex network of things. And we can see also that plants can move geographically, they migrate. 
Can can you explain the amazing some of the amazing discoveries we have done on trees? I mean, there's lately. so much to say, and it's it's not really my research, but I love love talking about it and telling the stories. Um, you know, the, the 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 big kind of revolution within this understanding of a particular forest ecology, you know, is is, a, is is an ecological understanding. So it's it's worth like trying to define a thing. Ecology is one that's kind of worth defining a little bit. And ecology simply means that things are in relationship with one another. They say that it says that the relationships between different things, whether those are beings, whether those are ideas, whether those are scientific disciplines, that the, the thing that binds them and makes them alive and makes them interesting and makes them matter in the sense of both being important and being present is their relationships, right? And it's, it's extraordinary the way in which so many scientific disciplines in the last kind of hundred years or so. I mean, the concept of ecology itself is, is quite old now, but it's taken a long time for various different disciplines to kind of discover this ecological possibility within their own discipline, right? Ecology isn't really a, a thing in itself. It's a, it's a way of thinking about the world. And, and of course, biology is one of the places in which this notion of ecology originates in this slow realization that the forests are not just you know, collections of, of beings, but really kind of interwoven networks of them. And so that the, the forest isn't just a collection of trees, but the, the trees are really dependent upon the whole entirety of the forest for their own being in various ways. You know, the, the discovery in the kind of 1970s, 1980s of what are called the mycorrhizal networks, which are these networks of fungi that connect plant roots. I mean, they don't even just connect them. They literally grow into them. So the kind of threads of the mycelium. Of the fungal material, they they wind right into the root cells of the plants, and they carry nutrients at different times. So in the summer, when the broadleaf trees, the deciduous trees, are soaking up all the sunlight, they're creating a lot of carbon, nitrogen, stuff like this. They send that into these ground networks, and they're taken up by some of the the coniferous trees, the pines, things like this that thrive in the winter, so that they can survive while they're in the shade. And then at the turn of the seasons in the winter, that that's reversed. The broadleaf trees drop their leaves. The pines start to get a lot of the sun. And to help them to, to, to feed this forest ecology, some of that goes back into the ground and is taken up by the trees that don't have their leaves at that time of year. But it's more complicated than that still because plants also have, those trees have a preference for their kin. So they have what are called mother trees, which have been shown to send more of the nutrients to plants that they've seeded or that are closely related to them in some way. So even within the forest ecology, you have these you have essentially families of, of trees that are supporting one another. And then it's not just nutrients that are being transferred, but information as well. And, and this is still only beginning to understand. But for example, when a, a tree on one side of a forest is attacked by insects, it can send a signal out through this network and through pheromones transmitted to, to the air to warn other trees of this attack. And they'll start producing defenses before the insects get there. So the forest is this place that's completely alive with interconnection, transmission, this kind of sharing cooperation, and also chatter, this information being shared about its own state. You know, and one of the things I think it does that's really interesting is that when you start to see that relationship, is it starts to blur all of the boundaries we have between individual and group, between members of different species, between the mm. whole idea that we, you know, that there's, there's kind of single reducible entities in the world. And you can do that action as much with the human as with, as with trees and plants. Yeah. And this is astonishing because again, that's very counterintuitive because we, we see ourselves as individuals, you know, we have a body and we see this, this is me and we see humans as a separate species from the rest. But what we realize more and more is that every living being depends on other species to exist. And our body just, just to function needs to be inhabited by millions of bacteria, for example. We even find that our DNA has been modified, not just by evolution, by, but by viruses. So again, can you elaborate on this? Because what is the meaning of that? Does it mean that we need to realize that everything is connected and that it doesn't really make sense to separate species and to separate individuals? And uh, yeah, what, what are the doors that it opens up in terms of even like philosophy? Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, we were talking before about this idea of the tree of evolution and even the most scientifically minded of us who are comfortable with the idea that kind of we came from, 
a, a lineage of primates and other apes. It starts to get weird when we start to think that we came from a lineage of bacteria as well, that we're descended from herpes, right? That, that's one of the kind of main bacterial ancestors that we have and that our ancestors take all these <laughs> forms back throughout history and that we, we come from this extraordinary lineage of, of all kinds of other strange creatures. And also, I mentioned Lynn Margulis earlier, you know, her work was entirely focused on the fact that that history of evolution has been one in large part of, of synthesis and cooperation rather than of kind of antagonism. It's not the, the Darwinian model that we've kind of been mostly educated into for the last kind of 150 years or so, which really stresses evolution as some kind of fight, essentially. You know, we come from a long line of beings coming into a relationship with, with each other and, and cooperating, working together, networking, essentially, rather than trying to kind of kill and eat each other. That's, that's, that's not the dominant uh, aspect of, of our history. And so, you know, it allows us to, to really understand the potentiality of our relations in, in an entirely different way, that it can be one of, of mutual flourishing rather than one of eternal competition, mm. which is largely what we, what we shared. But yeah, as you say, it, it has this, you know, relevance at the, the bodily level as well. One of the, one of the most extraordinary things I think I learned writing the book is that the extent to which we are not just the product of our, our, our ancestors directly, but as this kind of extraordinary ongoing crossbreeding that occurs between different types of beings. And in fact, that we, you know, that the, the uterus, the kind of cradle of mammalian life evolved not as the result of a, a series of traits being passed down from generation to generation, but as, as a viral infection that we actually were infected with the uterus by effectively, it's a little more complicated than that, but through this process of horizontal gene transfer from, from, from another kind of lineage. And again, you know, I, we keep coming back to this metaphor of the, the kind of the pillar or the tree of evolution. And every one of these things. So, you know, earlier I said that the, the, this tree, you know, is less of a pillar, more of something spread out. We also have to understand it as something that's completely entangled and kind of interwoven in all these kind of ways as well. That there's really no up or down or kind of separation. Like everything is fractally connected in this way. And then when you get down to the level of the individual, then you, you know, there's articles in scientific papers that are 20 years old now going like, maybe we should discard the idea of the individual at all. Because scientifically, it's unclear where the body begins or ends, right? Like we think of ourselves as a single species, a single individual, but we carry around about two kilograms of very distinct other genetic species in our gut and on our skin, these kind of microbacteria and stuff like this. And they're not just passengers. Like we have an ongoing relationship with them. One of the ways in which science has started to consider this, what we might replace the individual with is we might always replace it with this kind of immune system, this, this, this networked collection of beings that together respond to the outside in some way, uh, because they, they've shown that, you know, changing the nature of your, changing who lives in your gut <laughs> changes who you are. Like your, your brain behaves differently depending on the different little creatures that are also living in your body. So who are you? Right? Who am I if I am both a compound of the, hmm. the eye that I think I am, but the eyes, all these other little eyes that make me up? We're far more complex creatures than, you know, that we're even capable of thinking about on a day to day basis. You know, no one wants to go around constantly thinking like about yeah. every single bit of gut right here. But like when we're thinking about how we relate to the world and how we understand it and the extent to which we should break it down or draw these divisions, we should know that those division lines like run right through our own bodies. Uh, and they're uh, kind of really quite theoretically unsustainable. I mean, it opens up so many, so many things, and we would need 10 hours to go through that. But I, I would like to talk about language a little bit, because it, it's often said that sophisticated language is what sets us apart from other living beings. And usually we say it in a positive way, as if our way of communicating puts us above other species, make us more in intelligent. And interestingly, you argue that this is also what separates us from the world, what prevents us from understanding better how things really work. Can, can, can you elaborate a little bit on this, on language in general? Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's like the looking in the mirror thing, right? We put so much primacy on this thing that we do so well that we've taken it to be the be-all and end-all of intelligence. 
And language is marvelous and extraordinary. It's a huge part of, of obviously, of being human. That sounds kind of glib. But I mean, it's part of what makes us human at like a deep biological level, the structuring of our brains, the structuring of our, our lungs, the language that we the language that we produce is embodied, right? Because the languages that we speak are the result of our musculature, of, of the shape of our rib cages, of the structure of our throats. Like and, and so ultimately some of the things that the things that we express are the result of being physically like this. Right. So which is just to say that language is is not some like abstract, you know, is, is not something that again that separates us from the world in such a sense that it r- makes us rise above it in some way. Because I think I think that's partly what you're expressing is that we we, we put language or the ability to speak and, and read and write mm-hmm. onto this pedestal that makes us better. When of course it's it's a function of the world, um, it's a function of being in the world of, of breathing in and out, and and the origins of language much debated emerge from the world itself. We, there's a, a lot of arguments that the noises that we make and so on and so forth, they, they emerged in, in, in the result of, of speaking to one another, of listening to the sounds of animals and birds, of imitating them, of having these relationships with the world. And that survives in kind of very interesting ways. In the book, I wrote quite a lot about the work of the philosopher David Abrams, mm-hmm. who talks about the fact that like, you know, some of that relationship to the world was lost when we started writing things down. Because instead of like being these spoken interactions with the world that point directly to it, they've become abstracted into language. But he writes really beautifully about the fact that some of the world survives even in our written languages today. That like, you know, the letter A um, is comes from the Hebrew Aleph, which comes from the, a Phoenician character that was originally a bull's head, right? So you can see if you turn the capital A upside down, you're looking at a little bull with its horn sticky up, or the, the letter M. It comes from, again, the Hebrew mem and a Phoenician character before that, the men water. So it's the flowing waves or, or the, the quoth, the Q with its little monkey tail is what that originally signifies. So these little aspects of them survive. But, you know, and there's so much interesting to be done with language and there's so much that it lacks in becoming linguistic mm-hmm. beings in such a strong way. We tend to ignore a lot of the non-linguistic connection we have with the world, the world of experience or the world of the senses kind of, of direct exposure that isn't bound around with the kind of logics that we impose on things as soon as they come into language. And that's a whole much bigger subject. But, but it's, it's also worth mentioning that we are, we are really not yeah. unique in language, that many, many other creatures on the planet have languages, some of which we're starting to recognize in all kinds of strange places. Weirdly, one of the kind of best explored languages at the moment is prairie dog. You know, there's the weird little fluffy creatures that live in little burrows on the prairies, they have a highly developed language. They, they can put sentences together. They have, they have words to describe different creatures like bird, person, but they can also go like person, blue shirt, right? They can describe and they differentiate between people coming from direct, different directions and the clothes they're wearing. We've cracked this little tiny bit of their language. It's unbelievably fascinating. But, and and I, I really, I, it's very obvious that all animals have or some form of communication, if it's ant pheromones, if it's whatever, communication passes between creatures, even mm-hmm. if it doesn't do it in the kind of verbal structures that we understand to be language. There's a lot of interest at the moment in sort of like, yeah, yeah, you can you can you can keep going it because it's I guess communication is is everywhere. We just fail to understand how it works most of the yeah, time. Yeah, and and you know, and and a lot of it, like we said before about kind of animal behavior, we may not be capable of understanding, you know, and we go we have to be okay with that. But we also, we have to be okay with it that our inability to understand those different forms of communication doesn't make them lesser, right? It just reveals our own inability mm-hmm. to understand. Well, I would like to jump to another language that, that we have created made of zero and ones, zeros and ones, and which is a digital language that has led us to do very, very surprising things and uh, attempting to build a new type of what we call intelligence, you know, artificial intelligence. So that's another topic that you've been looking at a lot. And that, that's kind of your entry point, if I understand well. Okay, what is happening now? What, and first, what is the, the definition Again, like, like, what is AI? Why we call it intelligence? It's, it's a term that was coined first in 1956, I think, but it has evolved into something a bit confusing. But 
what is the idea here? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's kind of boring and, and difficult to untangle exactly what we're talking about in this case, but, but, but AI is having such a like bonkers moment, it's kind of maybe worth untangling a little bit, I agree. I, I think this, the first thing to do is to differentiate between the AI, the idea of AI that we hear about so much, Mm -hmm. which essentially is like computers that are as, that are smart, not just as smart as humans, but smart like humans, right? And possibly more so in some kind of way, at least in certain tasks, right? That's the idea of AI. Then we have actually existing AI, which is basically really fast, powerful computers doing statistics. It's these things called neural networks, large language models, these kind of technical terms. And I kind of wish we just used the technical terms because as soon as you bring in this term AI, you, you're, you're bringing in the Terminator. Like that's where everyone's mind goes immediately. And so we're kind of stuck with these mm -hmm. big cultural metaphors. The thing that I, I, I think is always really, really important to, to mention right now, at least, because there is this like insane contemporary hype, and that's what it is, about actually existing AI as though it's superhuman AI, is that we're talking about a very, like whatever artificial intelligence it is, this thing that's being discussed at the moment is such like a narrow version of, of what it might be. And we, we, could, we could go into that some more. But essentially what I mean is that the idea of AI, of, of computational intelligence, mm -hmm. of machine intelligence, let's, let's maybe call it that for a little while. Machine intelligence has, as you say, been around since the 1950s, possibly even earlier, I'd say, from Alan Turing's writings in the 1940s possibly even other than that. And this idea of machine intelligence, there have been a few ideas over the years about how it might be made, right? Like back in the, in the, in the 50s and 60s, there was a thing called connectionism, which was the idea that if you just plugged enough wires and processes into each other, you'd end up with something like a bit like a brain and that would sort of, consciousness would just kind of emerge from that complexity, or at least intelligence, if not consciousness. And later on, when that didn't really work out, you got into things like expert systems, which were just these like really complicated computer programs where they basically thought, look, if we just program all the rules of the world into this thing, even of like a small set of the world, like the business world into this thing, then maybe it'll be intelligent in that way. And that didn't work at all because the world is too complex to be put into all those little rules. And ultimately we kind of came back to connectionism in the form of mm -hmm. neural networks and neural networks are what, you know, are driving a lot of everything, which is, again, it's just loads and loads of powerful small computers all plugged into each other in complicated ways, doing a lot of statistical mathematics. And that, I get into trouble for saying this quite a lot, but there has not been any major conceptual breakthrough in artificial intelligence for years. The reason that we have a massive hype bubble around AI at the moment is because we've had 20 years of a corporate political situation where a few very large companies have uh, made a huge amount of money out of advertising against our common information. And they've used that money to buy very, very expensive computers and huge, huge numbers of them and, and accumulated so much data that you can train these systems. Because what these systems need is they need a lot of very powerful, fast computers to process data and a huge amount of data to learn from. And that's what Google and Facebook and Amazon and a couple of others have spent the last decade or more doing, right? G gathering money and data to make this particular kind of computing possible. And it is super impressive, right? Like it's weird, it's uncanny, uh, it, it's, a, it's a huge technical achievement. Is it intelligent? Um, depends how you define intelligence, right? I personally don't think that the ability to make money alone or to beat right, other things. I don't think being the best competitor is necessarily the form of intelligence. But these, these are the qualities that this particular kind of AI we see in the present moment which is, is developing towards because of where it comes from. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's also what's astonishing because it's becoming so good at what it was designed for, which is to replicate human intelligence. And as you said, it's not, it's not coming from, from nowhere. And there is a direction that is given to the way this is being developed. But, but still, I would like to stay a little bit on this because there was a lot, lot of hype, especially this year with uh, chat GPT and large language models starting to do things that are amazing to us because they do things in appearance as 
if they were humans, like being able to have a conversation, passing the Turing test, etc. So just to understand a little bit what is happening this year, what is so astonishing about these new capabilities? And are you actually surprised by the speed of innovation in that field right now? I mean, I don't think they're that amazing. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't find a really good chatbot to be that spectacular. No, no but I mean, I'm, I'm saying this because just a year ago, you were hearing interviews from people in that field that were telling that an AI will never be able to do this and that. And just a few months later, they I mean, to I'll, do I'll this. never bet so against it's surprising really powerful computers being able to do of, something. Like, of course, like if you if you put the the to the shared resources of five of the world's largest corporations, you hire all of the top academics of all the relevant disciplines, destroying a bunch of university departments in the process, and you focus these incredible resources on doing something. Humans are pretty good at doing quite a lot of things, but I I really I, I really meant what I said. I don't I don't think I, I think. ChatGPT or like the image generation are amazing technical accomplishments, but are they like that surprising? Are they that shocking? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are they that interesting? I'm not sure they are. There are applications for this kind of statistical inference, neural modeling, large language modeling that are super interesting. Like the fact that things like protein folding, drug discovery, these kind of large scale data exploration tasks that humans aren't very good at, these things are really good at, and they're going to transform. Unfortunately, because of the people who are in charge, they're probably also going to transform a whole bunch of other stuff that they should stay the hell away out, stay the hell out of, like human relations and our kind of interest in forms of creativity and self-valuation. But here we are. What do you think of technological determinism. I interviewed Kevin Kelly in that podcast, who is one of them, and then wrote books like What Technology Wants and, and The Inevitable. And according to you, and you start to mention it, but who and what is in control of the direction technology develop, development takes right now? I mean, and with the, I guess with there all are other ways respect that could Kelly, happen. respect Kevin Kelly, who's done a huge amount of work in the scene, and I, I grew up reading Wired magazine, and it kind of, in large part, made me interested in the things that I, I'm interested in and where I am, that's a, that, 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 that is the, the cheerleader for what, what might be called the California ideology or has been called the Californian ideology by some, which is this kind of, this idea of technological mm -hmm. progress trumpeting everything. That technology itself has some kind of trajectory and we can't get in its way and it will do whatever it wants and we just follow along and we, we live kind of in its way. Now that's never been true, right? Because people make technology and people decide what technologies they make. Te that, that's the idea of technological determinism that you mentioned, that the future is entirely determined by the magical appearance of wondrous technologies, the like of which we have never seen before, and we must bow down to their, their needs. And the people who make technology are the people who said it. You see it in the present moment when uh, a whole bunch of executives from Silicon Valley can make this huge noise about the dangers of artificial intelligence, the thing that they're developing, and then get huge audiences with prime ministers and heads of state and run these big AI summits, which, which you know, I, I find I find to be extraordinary and quite baffling because it's quite obvious where the actual problems are that we can't get enough attention drawn to. But those are the people who who are deciding what what happens with this because they are the ones, as I said, with the with the power and the money to to make these kind of technologies. Technological determinism is a kind of a, a, a get out clause for those people who can't or don't want to take responsibility for the things they're making in the world because they're excited about the things they're building and good for them. But they shouldn't perhaps have quite as much power to decide what happens to society more broadly. And do you think we're in that moment where AI and what we're starting to develop is, is starting to be at a point where we, we don't understand how it works really, because you hear that sometimes you heard some people at Facebook telling them, telling us like, we don't really understand how they come to that result. And, and what, what are the implications? Yeah, it's, it's there? a really, it's a really wonderful quality of them. And I, I've worked with this myself I and mean, the project that I write about in the book where I trained my own self-driving car system. I spent quite a lot of time trying to, to look inside it, right? What I really wanted to, there were several things I wanted to understand about mm -hmm. that program. But one of them was I, I I wanted to understand how this machine saw the world. Like I talked about earlier about how we share the world with like plants and, 
and other creatures. Like we share the world with these, whatever they are. And in this self-driving car pro project, I really wanted to kind of, to, to be able to look inside it in some way and really feel or see through its eyes. And it, the bottom line is it's really, really hard to do because the way in which machines perceive the world, store data about the world, it's just, it's not readable by humans. Like they fundamentally construct their models of the world in ways that are completely illegible to humans. In that case, I made a bunch of like images that were kind of printouts, representations of some of the data within the system, but they were, they were models that I made back that I could see. The thinking inside the machine is inscrutable. There's a lovely, lovely article, I think in the New Yorker from probably like five years ago now, maybe more when Google first started using machine learning in Google Translate. And it suddenly made its like language translation capabilities really, really powerful. But this journalist was like in, was like embedded in their office and kept like bothering the Google scientists to like explain how the machine worked. Right. He kept saying, like, can you just explain to me how like these two words relate until basically one of the engineers kind of explodes at him and says like, I, he, he says, I am not in the habit of trying to visualize multidimensional space, <laughs> which is what it is. It's this vast like array of data in weird relationships that makes no sense to the human mind. So you, you can do some work around understanding how these systems basically function, but you can't understand how they think because they think unlike human minds. And that's really interesting, right? Because it bothers or it should bother our like sense of how we operate in the world, which is largely based on that kind of deep understanding. But it should also perhaps prompt a reevaluation of that view of the world. Because of course we've lived around inscrutable intelligences the whole time and we've refused to recognize them as intelligent. Like we can't look inside the mind of a rabbit or a toad or a goldfish, right? Because its model of the world, as we've said before, is so radically different to our own. And because it's so radically different, we've basically refused for so long to acknowledge that it has a model at all, right? That it has that intelligence, that it has that consciousness. What's brilliant about AI, really, for me, is that it punches through that, right? We have to acknowledge that this thing has a model of the world, that it has this agency, that it has this thing that's like intelligence, whatever it is, right? And therefore, human intelligence is not the only thing going, right? That there's more than one kind of intelligence. And if more than one, then potentially infinite. And suddenly the world is filled with all of these different kinds of intelligences in this totally beautiful way. And that to me is like, that to me is the real purpose of so much of our technologies. Um, we talked earlier about the, the structure of forests, the networks that exist between trees under the forest. When the, when that research was first released in the journal Nature in the 1990s, the title they chose for the special issue of Nature, the scientific journal, when they published it was Wood Wide Webs, right? Because it was just at a time when people, and particularly academics, were starting to be connected to this thing that we can't now know as the World Wide Web and the internet. And, and so they had an idea of what networks were based on their understanding of computer networks. Before we built computer networks, we didn't really understand what these kind of networks looked like. We subsequently realized studying the internet, we developed new kinds of mathematics, which we then went and reapplied back to nature in order to understand the forest networks better. It turned out that the forest networks follow certain kinds of mathematical topology in the same way that the internet does. They're not the same thing, but certain rules and particularly certain metaphors apply. And I think that about that a lot, that so many of the things that we make are attempts to remake things that exist already in nature, perhaps better in certain ways for our purposes, but really that are not novel at a universal scale, right? That the evolution came up with most of this stuff a long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. But because we're quite strange and solipsistic little creatures, we need to kind of make them ourselves before we'll see them as real, right? And, and I, for me, that's what AI is doing, okay. right? It's this, it's this, we make these toy intelligences just so that we can really start to see a much broader idea of what intelligence is. Well, that's a very positive way of looking at it and to say, okay, th this is what it's meant to do, like to make us realize that there are other forms of intelligence. But, but that's also very scary for, for me to imagine that we are creating something that is 
very powerful and that is developing very rapidly and we don't really understand how it works or where it's going. Well, that's politics for you. Like it's, that's, um, when, that's when this moves from being a technological question into a political question. Yep. It becomes a question of power. Who is making mm -hmm. these things? What are their intentions? How much power do they have over the rest of us? How much power of refusal do we have? Who, who shapes these things and in okay. whose interest? Any technological question at sufficient scale is a political question. And it's uh, one that requires far, far more of us to be involved in actively and with regard to our interests, just as the rest of our politics does. I would like to talk about big challenges for humanity. And for years, I've been trying to find good ways to explain our predicament and, and the fact that as we grow and multiply and develop, we are consuming all the resources and killing all the most of the living beings and deteriorating the condition of, the, of life for the future and climate change on top of it. There is a great insight in the intro of your book related to how corporation, corporations work. That is to say, as in, you compare it to artificial intelligence, to, to the fact that actually it's already there, it's already acting as a, as a program and doing some of the, some stuff that we that are running out of control. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a it's a, a line or a joke from the science fiction writer Charlie Strauss, where he makes the very good point that artificial intelligence, real artificial intelligence, active artificial intelligence, out of control artificial intelligence already exists in the world and it's corporations. Uh, corporations are large autonomous entities who are capable of independent action, who have legal standing, right? They have legally protected speech. They can act in law. They can sue people and be sued. They, they can have private bank accounts. They can act in all the ways that people do with none of the accountability to people that we have in normal human relationships. And that's why they're so damaging because they remove a lot of the safeguards of what we might call civilized behavior from, from human action. And they abstract it away, and, and you get these, these vast resource-hungry resource entities that have very narrow interests, right? Profit and loss. That's really all they care about. Not getting sued, maybe. But that, that's how they define themselves. That's their little world view of experience. And we already live with them, and they're already an incredibly huge damaging thing to the planet. So when people talk about the, the dangers of AI, I think it's hilarious because we already live in a, a place in which there's very large, powerful, non-human entities damaging us and the world in very, like, very real ways that we very, find it very difficult to address. And so, yeah, I, I was just putting AI into this kind of special category of things when, as I say, we, c we really should be talking about who has, mm. who has power, uh, where that power resides rather than like just the narrow focus on technology, which is what they want us to do. The, the, the current big AI safety debate is an attempt so to redirect attention from wealth inequality, power inequalities towards like the development of software. So we, we are facing extremely complex issues today and we seem to be unable to really understand what is going on and in many ways and even more incapable of finding solutions. In your view, are we able to deal, uh, what's your take on that and that affirmation? And are you able to, uh, do you think we are able to deal with that level of complexity? Um, I, I go with Sven Lindqvist, the great Swedish. Uh, so yeah. Sven Lindqvist, in his introduction to his extraordinary book, Exterminate All the Brutes, he writes, you already know enough. We all know enough already. The only thing is to decide to act. I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's minds, really, on some deep level of the situation that we're in. The IPCC she reports, the like actual scientific reports from pretty much every scientific body on earth, the, the US army, the Chinese Communist Party, they all agree on this. They all point at a very serious trajectory for, for what's happening to us and the planet at the moment. And one of the things we're told over and over again is that it's too complicated, right? We're always being told this is too complex, it's really complex. It's not, right? We're burning fossil fuels, increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that's leading to unsustainable heating that is going to render vast areas of the earth uninhabitable in the next decades. And uninhabitable doesn't mean like uncomfortable. It means like it'll kill you if you go there, right? Or if you can't leave. Like this is the level of, of emergency we're facing. At the same time, we're facing the biodiversity crisis, wiping out all these species. Like this is, this is all real. And I don't think the problem of addressing it 
is one of complexity. I think it's one of agency and power, right? On the one hand, you have powerful interests who think this doesn't apply to them. And so they're not doing anything about it or actively making the situation worse, which is the people who own the oil and gas companies, the, the people that they pay in government and so on and so forth. It's not even a conspiracy. It's just the way things work. Right. And on the other hand, you have most of us that have been trained into this kind of learned helplessness in the face of these situations. And I feel this very strongly because, you know, I, I, I worked on this very specifically just within the narrow context of technology for so long, right? Talking about the internet and the large kind of algorithmic systems that it's generated and is part of as things that make people feel helpless, right? Because we know there's this vast structure going on, but we don't have any keys to get in there and address it or unlock it in any way because we've been pretty much actively denied the skills for doing so because we've been educated into systems that haven't prepared us for this complexity of the world, right? But complexity isn't, isn't a problem, right? The world is complex and that complexity is brilliant. It's what gives rise to life itself. There's this belief that we sort of need to conquer it in some way, that we need to master complexity, which is a, a, a dominating kind of colonial imperial attitude at heart, right? We don't, we just need to live better within that complexity in better relation to the species around us. We know, and to be very clear, we also know what needs to be done, right? We know what forms of democratic reorganization will move us past the current impasse, right? We know about the kinds of technologies we need to do. We also know we need to change radically, that we can't continue on our current path, that the degrowth is the only option for any kind of uh, ongoing survival in this path. We know all those things. So the, argue, so the questions to ask is not really like, what should we do? It's like, what's stopping us from doing it in the present moment? And how do we shift that situation? And is there an answer to that related to how we inhabit the world? And uh, with the idea that we need to reconnect with the other form in, of intelligence uh, around us. You know, yeah, I mean, I, I take multiple tracks on this, but and, and part of that is forms of technological education and, and building agency in all kinds of ways. I do I do workshops where I teach people to code and I do workshops where I teach people to build wooden structures. I think these are all valued forms of learning that build um, kind of um, resilience in, in community and, and all these kind of forms of power. But a shift in consciousness is also required. Like we're, we're not going to get to where we need to get to as a, as a species, as a planet, without a, a real change in the way that we imagine things. And so a big part of that is is what we might term this kind of like animist reawakening, this kind of return to some kind of consciousness that I fundamentally believe is inherent to life, as in I believe it's shared by all living beings and by living beings, I include things like rocks and, and some other stuff as well, to non-animate life. So what might be termed a planetary consciousness, it's real, it exists, you can access it. And many more of us need to be able to access it in order to make the kind of changes that are necessary for our mutual flourishing and the survival of as many of us as possible as to what's coming down the line. To, to be clear, when you say, because uh, we didn't talk much about consciousness, we talk about intelligence and consciousness is a very different topic, but how do you see things now personally? Is it like uh, the big Gaia hypothesis like James Lovelock or every everything is connected and everything is conscious in, in some ways? And how, do you, how did you Yeah, I mean, Gaia is one very, very good way of looking at it. It brings in the important qualities of the kind of emphasizing kind of feminine regenerative energy. I would also refer to kind of non-binary histories of that as well, but I would refer largely to, to an energy field or to an understanding of life that's more akin to the Einsteinian that we brought up earlier. Quantum physics tells us that what underlies reality is a shifting field of energies. That's the same that's taught by the few remaining shamans of ancient Andean religions who live in far South America, who also teach an animism and a respect for all forms of life. It's the same understanding of the world that was taught by Buddhist practitioners in the East and was brought to the West by people like Alan Watts, who said one of the most beautiful things I ever heard, which is that we do not come into the world, we come out of it like leaves on a tree or waves in the sea, right? We are part of this world and almost all of the damage that we've done to it and to one another can be attributed to us forgetting that. And so remembering that connection is, is some of the most important work we can do to at least begin to start on other paths of repair. And that begins with experimenting things 
with your body, with silencing your thoughts? You know, what, what are the, the things that people can take away and, and start? I'm not about to start giving full advice on all that kind of stuff, but uh, there's plenty of different paths to it. Uh, what's what worked for me you? is long periods of study, like thinking about the same kind of things that are in the book. Delics are one way of accessing it. So is fasting, meditating, hiking. All of these things are different doorways to activating a different kind of consciousness. The primary one is, is opening oneself up to the world, listening to the creatures around you and finding connections to them, however that is, or whatever it is that that works for you. Uh, but, but I was uh, like, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be esoteric about that. It's just, it's on the edge of language, right? Yeah. So we've talked for like over an hour now about like some of these kind of practical technical aspects. And when I start talking about a change in consciousness, and it's the reason I don't write about consciousness in the book, is that consciousness is, is something beyond language, right? It's, it belongs to the realm of experience. And so it's something that's very hard to describe and speak about because you immediately get bogged down into a bunch of stuff. But, but I, I want to stress that it's very, very important to all the things that I've talked about, but it's not something that we can communicate in quite the way that we're talking today. Interesting. Yeah. It's not going through words. Going back to the topic of language. So that have a couple of questions that I always ask in the end to, to my guests. So when you look at the world today and its trajectory, what scares you the most and what gives you hope and maybe even you no know, joy? I think I'd be pretty clear about what gives me what scares me. Um, you know, the trajectory we're on is is pretty serious and I don't like the look of the future very often. You know, I worry about the future for future generations and even for many people who are living now and certainly for all the other creatures that we share the planet with. What gives me hope is the capacity for change, always. You know, we are endlessly capable of change. We have changed utterly throughout our evolutionary history and, and, and even in, in recent history. These shifts are always possible and they always seem to be completely unimaginable until suddenly they happen, right? We are capable of changing in and ourselves and we're capable of changing as, as wider societies. I think the future is going to be really, really tough. I mean, this, this is not to say I think we're going to magically get through what's coming uh, unscathed. It's going to be really bad at times. And I'm afraid of that. We should all be afraid of that. Um, but that's not the same as, as being kind of hopeless. Um, and, and so I work on practices that are meant to empower and engage people and allow them to feel that they have a role to play in a, in a world that's going to change very rapidly uh, and in and, and, you know, occasionally frightening ways. Um, but it's still a world in which we can and will live and can affect and can change. Last questions, the tough one, toughest one, two books that everybody should read. Uh, if you haven't read Braiding Sweetgrass, a novel by a indigenous scientist who manages to weave these different practices together in such fascinating ways, then you've, then you're, you know, you should go and read that because it will change the way you, you see and approach the world. And yeah, since I mentioned him earlier, why not go and read some books about Alan Watts, who's one of the best people who explains what a yeah. different consciousness looks like to people who've been, you know, raised with a real absence of that awareness. And if you don't read, there are tons of content through podcasts and videos from, from yes, these indeed. lectures. Well, thank you so much for your time, James. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, I will put the list on, 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 on the website as usual. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.